Matthew 6, you know, it's the first sermon that Christ preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm going to draw our attention for the next moments to laying up treasure you cannot lose. Laying up treasure that you cannot lose. Verse 19, 619. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust up corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust up corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Could we read that verse together, verse 21? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know why you're in church today? Because you must have some treasure here. Because your heart's here. 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Would you read verse 24 together with me as well? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God in man. Now, notice, you cannot, it's an impossibility, serve God in man. It doesn't say you should not, or partially, he says you can't. And then let's drop down for time's sake to verse 33. Read it together with me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Then we pray. Father, what a privilege to have the Bible. And as we've sung, I have decided to follow Jesus. I think most of us can reflect back to the day when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And if there's anyone here this morning that just has not made that decision yet, but they're thinking about it, I'm praying that you would help them. Draw them, save them. And Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Would you help us to divorce ourselves from yesterday? Help us to cast our cares of tomorrow upon you now so that this would not be wasted time. Give me a pure heart and willing hands to work just now. In Jesus' name, and amen. amen. So the key verse is verse 33, seeking first the kingdom of God. But have you ever wondered why? It's funny how if you take $50, it's looks so big when you take it to church, and yet it's so small when you take it to Canada's Wonderland. Christ promises here, it is put first, he says, the kingdom of God, and he says, then the material things will take care of itself. Now, we're having kind of a stewardship Sunday, as we mentioned this morning, that we are stewards, we're either good stewards, of what God has given us, or we're bad students. So verse 19 through 24 is the believer's basic giving principle here. You find Christ states several reasons why living for material things are foolish. For <clears throat> one, material things on earth do not last. We find fabrics <clears throat> back in the Old Testament were really treasured. If I remember in Joshua 7, the people that come across Jordan River, they had defeated Jericho. But while they were doing that, there was a man by the name of Achan. He saw a Babylonian garment. Garments were really valued. Don't forget the ladies of Israel hadn't had new dresses in 40 years. Because they had been in the wilderness. Their garments, read it, had lasted 40 years. And so Achan takes it, and God was displeased because God says the first fruit, Jericho, was his. They could have all of the other spoils from the other cities, but this is mine. See, the first fruits are the Lord's. He's telling us and giving us a principle. So Achan took it, and then he went home, secretly hid it 
underneath the sand in his tent. And God's blessing stopped, and 36 men died trying to take the small, small city of Ai. And God says, whoa, we've got to deal with this. See, Achan put material things ahead of God, and he paid the price. They stoned him and his family. He, see, yet, he talks about garments hoarded, hoarded, moths will eat them up, rust ruins metal. You know, I think if you listen very carefully right now, I think your car and my car is rust lights are taking chunks out of it. Are you listening? You say, where did that rust come from? That's what rust lights. He's, that's the way it is. You find treasures used for God's glory are invested in heaven. Though. So where it lasts forever, you, you give something to the Lord and the Lord's work, he says, it's going to bring you a reward. The way a Christian uses his wealth is an indication of the condition of his heart. He says, if your eye is single, meaning that if you're focused on spiritual things, if your eye is healthy, he says, you're going to be blessed. Also, if he spends his time and money on his business, sports, pleasure, and neglects God, then his heart is in his business or his sports and pleasure and is not fixed on God. I have to be careful here. Uh, years ago, I met a man, look at his family and you think, whoa, this guy's been out of work for 50 years. And uh, talking to him, he had taken a vow of poverty. He thought that was spiritual. I says, what does that look like? Well, he says, every last thing, a dollar that I make, uh, I give to God's work. And I says, what about your family? His wife wasn't happy and the kids weren't happy. And they were living like paupers, but he thought he had made a vow to God. That's not what God is talking about here. Don't say what he thought, this fellow thought he was really spiritual because he was giving more than others. That's not God's way, folks. We find in verse 22, he talks about that single eye. I think the best illustration, uh, I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament in Genesis. Uh, for time's sake, we won't read it, but in Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot, his nephew, they had their flocks had grown to such proportion that they couldn't, there wasn't enough pasture land. So Abraham says, we've got to have, we're, we're, tr we're in trouble. He says, we're going to separate. You take one side, I'll take the other side. But he let Lot, his nephew, choose. And Lot, who should have been wise enough to let Abraham, who had seniority, say, oh no, Uncle Abe, you choose. No, he says, you choose. And so he did. And he looks at the plains of Sodom. And he says, wow, though that grass there is the best I've ever seen. That's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose him. And it says, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And that was the first step of a downfall of Lot who messed up his life and his family's life. And even in his lifetime, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. If you ever go to Israel, we've been there a couple times, and on the north end of the Dead Sea, you won't find anything living. You still find remnants of brimstone and ashes where the city of Sodom and Gomorrah stood. Nothing has grown there for centuries. He, that's what he's saying. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. You see, his was not. So people who don't consider Abraham foolish, but the good is always the enemy of the best. And so you have to be careful. Don't be a double-minded man. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James 1, 8 says. Verse 23, evil means the opposite of single. And it suggests a sinful outlook, a double vision. In verse 24, Jesus clearly tells us that we cannot look in two directions at the same time. We cannot serve two masters. and We cannot love and 
live for God and material wealth at the same time. Praise God, I was just thinking earlier when we sang, I decided to follow Jesus. That was in 1971. You know, that's 53 years ago. I still remember that wonderful day when the Lord saved me, my wife the same day. You know, we've been able to put our head on our pillows at night knowing that should Jesus come or death would claim us, we would be home with him. I hope you can say that this morning as well. But that's the got to be focused. But then uh, we were saved and some uh, we had we started learning. Say, and then we started learning about money. And, uh, and this is what he's talking about here. When some Christians hear teaching about money, many think that it's only talking about material things. They think how they spend it has nothing to do with their spiritual life. God is interested in what you spend your money on. You cannot separate the sacred from the secular. Christ taught that we can lay a treasure in heaven where it really counts for eternity. Now the caution here is you ought to be investing in every cause that you can. Good cause. Now how many of you have gone to, let's say, Walmart or some store? Would you like to do like something to this and this and that? They have a, you want you want to donate two dollars for this and this? No, I says I, I don't have a place to give. Oh, where do you give? I says I give to the Lord at church. <laughs> you see, you don't give to that Walmart. No, I learned. How many of you know of the United Way? When I say the United Way organization is supposed to. Have, and so before I gave money, this is years ago. I went to one of the meeting headquarters. It was in St. Thomas, Ontario, and they sent. They gave out financial reports of the United Way. And I'm sitting there, and I'm a relatively young Christian. And I thought, if I every dollar I give, it would go to help people. Well, 59 cents out of every dollar went to administration. You know, when you give at church, 100% of your dollar goes to God's work. I should hear an amen or something. <laughs> Right? So I said, that'd be foolish, 59%. So I'm just saying, and we need to lay up treasure where it will last. So as we think of this, verse 21, it talks about where your treasure is there with your heart, but also we find if, if your treasure is in RSPs or GICs, your thoughts are going to be on them, what you've laid aside. There is an ever-present danger of worshiping mammon rather than God. Mammon is the word for riches here in verse 24. Money, wealth, sometimes personified as a false god or an object of worship, often regarded as an evil influence in our life. So, like what the psalmist says in Psalm 62, 10, if riches increase, set not your heart upon them. I would venture, I'm going to challenge you to do something. You know, these people that come on the, the announcements on television, I want $6 million, I want $10 million, I want $100,000. You know, they have a big check. check Do a study. I've read studies of people who have won that much money, and in 10 years, they've self-destructed. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Well, you say, I think I can handle a million. <laughs> well, maybe you could, maybe you could but we find, where do I start? You say, well, if I'm going to lay up treasure, where do I start? Well, I'm glad you asked. Back up a little bit to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 3. Now, we're learning how to lay up treasure in heaven. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Back up, Jack, Malachi 3 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say, Wherein shall we return? They didn't even know. You read the whole book, and they had gone so far from the Lord, they didn't even know where to start. Now, verse 8. Will a man rob God? 
when I first read that, listen to me, when I first read that, I said, no way, nobody be bold enough to rob God. I was really wrong. He says, yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And his answer, in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with the curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye there, bring ye all the tithes unto the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Well, so what's the problem? The tithe is the minimum practice. Now, you know what the tithe is. I did have a couple of sheets of paper here. They have somewhat disappeared with the music, so those of who had that music would you there's two sheets. <laughs> I thought I don't know if I should leave that up there because it's coming here. So I need two volunteers. Could I have a couple of you fellas? Thank you so much. One on this side, one on this side. So, who already know? Hold it up nice and high. What is a tithe? How many of you know what a tithe is? Okay, if you don't know, would you hold this up? So, let's say if I earn $10, how much of that is the Lord's? One dollar. Okay, what if I really get a good job and I earn a hundred dollars? How much is the Lord's? Whoa! See, I still get to keep 9 out of 10. I still get to keep 90 out of 10. That's not bad, eh? So a tithe is whose? That is the Lord. So let's say, when I was uh, first saved, I, I maybe a month or two, somebody had the nerve to preach on money at church. Can you figure? That was a joke. <laughs> and I, I knew I should give a tithe. Well, I was, <laughs> this will date me, but I was making $150 a week. And I had a wife, and I had to support a family. And that, so what I did, okay, Lord, I'm going to start giving. $150 a week now. I said to Mary, I'm going to, we're going to give $20 a week. Now, is that, a, is that a tie? Is that more than a tie? It's a bit more than that. Ties and offerings, it says. So I said, okay, I'm going to start. We're going to start giving $20 a week. Whoa, when you get $150. Now, not only before the government, everybody else takes their part. Now, I've got that much less to spend my money on. Whoa. And so for 53 years, almost, <laughs> he said, it's not $20, but we have given and our biggest outgoal still today is what we give to the Lord. I don't say that very indociously. I'm just saying God has helped me. He's given me a wife that's frugal. And we can give to God's work. So now we understand what a tithe is, right? So when we're talking about a tithe, a tenth, we're talking about if I earn, we taught our children that from young on. If, you, if they mow grass, if they can get paid for shoveling snow, and they come home with a $20 bill, oh, let's do the math here. Which is which of you is smart? <laughs> you are? He admits it. If you get $20 for mowing a lawn, how much of that would be the Lord? Give him a hand. <laughs> So that's where we that's where we start. And so if we look at in the Old Testament, there's a lot of verses if you're taking notes. In Genesis 14:20, Abraham gave to the priest Melchizedek a tithe. So that was a long time before the law ever was started. And then in Leviticus 27, 30 through 32, God commanded the tithe under the law, and for 1,500 years from the time of Moses to the time of Christ, the law 
they gave a tithes and offerings. And then we find that in Matthew 23, they were still giving tithes. Now he's we're close enough. Let's look at Matthew 23. Because I get this argument, oh, the tithe was just for the law and the Old Testament. No, it was started before the law with Abraham. He tithed. It was during the time of the prophets and the law until Jesus. And notice what they were still doing in Matthew 23, 23. And this is a warning here to religious leaders. 23, 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe and mint, and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done. In other words, ye ought to have given tithes, and not to leave the other undone. So these religious leaders were so meticulous, even from the herbs in their gardens, they would tithe. But it was just a formality to them. But we're looking at the principle. They knew the principle in the Old Testament. So the Jew under law was commanded to give a tenth, plus other offerings. And those who have really studied this subject, they, I've heard that by the time they gave their tithe and their temple tax and other regulations that were required by the Jew, they would have given up to 23% of their income to, to the Lord. See, and as New Testament Christians living under grace, should we not give as much or more? Right? If they under law had to give that, don't you think you and I as New Testament believers, aren't we required also to give? So the reward for faithful tithing in the Old Testament was material wealth. The reward for faithful stewardship in the present church age is spiritual blessings. God doesn't always pay you off in dollar signs and cents. God will bless you. God will bless you. Marriage, God will bless your family. There's a, one of my favorite verses in Proverbs. It's Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. After 45 years of ministry, I've had more people cry and weep over wasted life, broken hearts, and broken families. If only I could retrace my life. They didn't put God first. It was just about me, mine, and what I can get out of it. And now, they're empty. They are full of regret. Don't, don't go that route. We can lay up treasure in heaven. What you give to the Lord is secure. There's no inflation in heaven. So we find the reward for faithful stewardship in this present time is in the church. Now, you say, well, where, where should I give it? Now, I know if you let's watch the television, the televangelists, the radio preachers are all vying for your money, right? Let me show you where you should put it. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. When I come, whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So notice, bring it into the storehouse. As I have given order in all the churches, verse 1, the first day of, what's the first day of the week? Monday? Sunday. Sunday, very good. He says that you, 
And every one of you lay by him in store. Now in store, remember in the Old Testament, we read that the Israelites had to bring their offerings, their tithes and offerings into the storehouse. That was the temple. The tabernacle, the temple. But that's no longer in existence. We're a New Testament church. So you bring it to the, the church. Their local church was the assured storehouse in the early churches. That's where they were together. But how do I know my church will use my money right? Well, you, that's why you need to be in the right church. And if you, I know you're in the right church. If you have, at the, at the end of the year, you have a business meeting, right? And at New Hope, we have a statement of income every cent that has come in and every cent that has gone out through the year. And it's all itemized there. And people feel comfortable and secure about that. You know, and I'm so glad. As we look at this afternoon's message, I hope that you'll stay for that. You know what God can do with a church this size for world missions if you get a hold of the Bible principle that I'll be teaching you. But when it comes to giving, you find the local church was the place. And the New Testament principle of giving to the saints. <clears throat> Fine. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren who was strong in Judea, which also they did, and sent him by the elders, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Acts 11, 29. See, when it came to finances, it was as important as the preaching of the gospel. They dealt with it. With church leaders dealt with it. And there is no recorded account of an individual giving an offering to an institution except through the local church. The stories. That's what I believe for 53 years. And I have one string guitar that I play on that all the time. And so we find. Now how should we give? Now back, go a little further to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Now, let me ask, before you read that, let me ask you this. Will you do what the Bible says? Will you do what this verse says? Verse 9. Uh, chapter 9, pardon me, verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Say it with me. For God loveth us sheer food. That's where we would get our word hilarious from. Uh, how come sometimes when the offering is going by, sometimes Christians look like they're having a root canal? It's not as bad as that. God loves what kind of giver? Cheerful giver. I, I, I love this story. Two, two country boys were standing out behind the barn talking one day, and Bob said, Billy, if you had a million dollars, would you give me half of it? Of course I would, replied Bob. You know, I would share with you. What if you had $10,000? Would you give me half of that? Of course, Bob replied instantly. We've been friends since we were little. Well, said Bill, scratching his chin, if you had two pigs, would you give me one? That's not fair, shouted Bob. You know I have two pigs. <laughs> you see, talk is easy. But when the rubber hits the road, what are you going to do about laying up treasure in heaven? It's easy to fall into the trap and talk of how we would like to give to the Lord. But we fail to grasp the concept of stewardship. Where we are right now in our spiritual lives. I don't know where you're at, but God is so fair. A tithe is a tithe, and He wants us to be able to give it and give it cheerfully. The storehouse is the Lord's. And so, also, we give it to the church. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Let me, I was impressed with this, and I'll close with it. They up treasure in Him. There was a man by the name of Matt, Matt Dawson. 
in Detroit, Michigan. You all know where Detroit, Michigan is. That was a black man, married, uh, I mean, never married, stayed single, and he was an employee of the Ford Motor Company for 59 years. We find he lived modestly and he drove a Ford Escort. How many of you know what a Ford Escort is? Well, two of us. When this was written, he had given Father $251,000 to the Mission State College for Blacks, $400,000 to Wayne State University, $300,000 to Michigan State University. In total, at the time, he had given over $1 million in his lifetime. And his only motive, he said, was to give others a chance he never had. Now, you and I as Christians, if you're a believer this morning, we have a loftier goal than that. We give so others can have a chance to hear what you and I have heard, the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the light of the good news of the gospel is only good news if you hear it before you die. And yet, there are multitudes and multitudes that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who do you think God's going to hold responsible for getting the gospel to the lost in this world? It's churches like yours and New Hope, churches in our country, Christians who love God more than they love things. They love God more than they love money and try to hoard it for somebody else. You don't even know who's going to spend it. You see what he's saying here? And God is so fair. God wants us to give to others so they have a chance to hear the good news. So it's not about money. The church doesn't want it. It's not how it's talking about money. But there is a stewardship that God has incorporated. And he's laid out a tithe. Tithe and offerings. Everybody. If you say, well, I, I, I'm out of a job. Well, guess what? You don't have any income. What, what does God expect you to get? Is it coming good? Is it God? He's so fair. So, but what you give to the Lord, He says, lay up treasure in heaven. There's going to be no thieves there, no rust, and no moth. It's going to be there and we'll meet it when we get it. Amen. Let's go. Father, thank you. Thank you for the simple truth. And God, you have to help us with this. Because we're born selfish. We're born sometimes thinking that this is all that there is. And sometimes so many people have the idea that he who has the most toys wins. God, help us not to think like that. Help us to think spiritual things. Help that our eyes will be healthy. And we will see the true value of this world and its fleeting riches. The system of this world is going to vanish and it's all going to be burned up anyway. God in heaven, would you help every believer here? This morning, I know my message has been towards Christians, but maybe you're here. Say, I came this morning because somebody invited me I came this morning and I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. And I know it, but I'm, I'm considering it. I'd like to know more about it. Is there anybody that would raise their hand and say, Preacher, Pastor, please. That's me. I'm, I'm concerned for my soul and I want to know how I can be saved to go to heaven. Young or old, is there anybody? Okay, maybe you're here and you say, I've been saved. I've been recently saved and I've not been baptized in deep water. And I'd like to be baptized. I'd like to see somebody. I'd like to talk to the leadership of the church. And, and I'd like to take care of that next time we have a baptism. Is there anybody here like that? Amen. Is there anybody? And then, I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand or anything, but have you ever come to that place where you realize that God is so good to us and He wants, if you're a Christian, He says the tithe and offerings are the Lord's. That's the starting point.
maybe you've never realized that, or maybe you've been selfish and you're trying to lay up treasure here. But why don't you consider laying up treasure in heaven? You will not regret that. You might not have all the toys and things that maybe some others at work do, but guess what? You're going to have riches that are going to meet you when you get to glory, and they're going to last forever. Put your heart where your treasure is there, where your heart be also. So lay up treasure in heaven. Now, Father, bless your people here. Thank you for your mercies to us. Thank you for church. Thank you for the freedom in Canada to still meet without being persecuted. Thank you for fellowship. And uh, it's always a blessing to meet around the table. And thank you for the food that's been brought and prepared. We ask now that you would bless it as we partake of it. And would you bless this afternoon a focal and a vital message for this church for this hour. We ask God these things in Jesus' name. Amen.